This is a processor from Intel from around 1985, almost the same size as this processor, but this one is 10,000 times more powerful. Okay, so how is this physically possible? All processors have something called a transistor. This is an example of a transistor. The transistor has something called a source. Here's the gate, and here's the drain, or the collector. Source, gate, drain. Okay, the source gives electricity, the drain receives electricity, and the gate is the one that allows or doesn't allow the electricity to pass to the other side. If electricity passes from the source to the drain, it gives you a 1. If it doesn't pass, it gives you a 0. That's how computers work or how the processor works. One or zero, binary. So, the transistor is a very important part of the processor or of the complete logic gates. This is a transistor in general. Now you know how the processor works. This processor from 1985 had 275,000 transistors. 275,000 of these little things. At that time, for example, the processor I have today, a modern processor of the same size or maybe even smaller, has over 16 million transistors. Over 16 million in the same size or smaller. Okay, so why is this not going to continue? Why is it physically impossible for this to go on forever? What allowed us to have more transistors while keeping the same processor size is that the transistor itself keeps getting smaller. If the transistor shrinks, it means you can fit more transistors into the processor. More transistors means more processing, better performance, and smaller devices. That processor from 1985 had a size of 1.5 micrometers, which means that the size of one transistor was roughly between a bacterium and a virus. From 1985, of course, that was something you couldn't see with the naked eye, extremely small. Now, currently, for example, the processor I have, the Ryzen 9, its transistor is smaller than DNA. Human beings manage to create something smaller than DNA. There is even a transistor that's just one nanometer in size. That's one nanometer. Which means, now you're starting to enter atomic sizes. We're reaching the atom. At that size, you're getting into complex chemical compounds. Okay, any logical person would think, we can't build something smaller than this. And you'd be right. You can't build something smaller than the thing that is already building everything. Atoms. How do you build something smaller than the atom when the atom is what builds things? And this is where the idea comes. Processors, as we know them now, can't continue. Let me give you an example now that will make you understand everything very simply. Okay, we have the same transistor as before, but this time, we'll draw the electricity itself. Let's draw the electron. This electron, let's make it a blue circle. If it passes here, it gives us one. If the gate stops it, it gives us zero. The gate decides whether the electron passes to the drain. But the electron has to be excited to pass. How do you excite it? Through the electricity coming from your power supply. Simply put, depending on the voltage, the gate decides whether electricity passes or not. That makes sense. Now it gives us one and zero. Great. The problem engineers, specifically architecture engineers, processor engineers, are facing now is this. Let's say this transistor reaches atomic size. The electron is part of the atom, and its size will be larger than the transistor itself. If that happens, there's a phenomenon in quantum mechanics called quantum tunneling. This means that the electron can skip the gate because it's too big, and also because at the quantum level, the electron behaves like a wave. But to simplify, let's just think of it as something physical. At the quantum level, it skips the gate and passes freely without any excitation. It just passes to the other side and gives you a one. Even when you didn't want a one, you wanted a zero. This destroys the whole concept of computing. If you can't control the zeros and ones, the entire binary system, the idea of processors fails. So this is the problem with processors right now. This is a real problem. At some point, processor speed, power, and performance will stop improving. It won't develop anymore. Either you make it bigger or you increase watt consumption. For example, Apple's M1 processors, the M1, or I forgot which exact model, 
what they did was basically connect two processors together. That was the only way to scale. Because you don't want your phone to get bigger. Because the processor is bigger. You don't want your computer to grow in size. If that were the case, all devices would keep growing. So engineers from Intel, Apple, AMD, and all chip manufacturers are in a dilemma. They're facing a real problem. Literally, they've been stopped by the laws of physics. And if there's anything you can't break or escape in this world, it's the laws of physics. So, what's the solution? This part of the video requires a little focus. The solution to the problems we just mentioned with traditional processors is a completely new way of computing. Scientists said, since we're limited by the atom's size in traditional processors, why not use the atom itself to process information? I want you to throw away everything you know about physics or the laws of physics that you learned in your life. Here we start entering the world of magic and sorcery. Of course, it's not really magic or sorcery. It's logical, real, measurable, and calculated. But physics at the atomic level is completely different from physics at the larger scale we live in. Okay, atoms, photons, or anything at the atomic level have three states. The first state, if we measure them, like observing them under a microscope, they only show two states. You can't see more than that. If you do a measurement, you'll only see two possibilities. Let's call this particle a qubit. So, the first state, measurement shows it as a one. Let's assign this as one. The second state, measurement shows it as zero. So, this is the binary system we know, one and zero. Okay, what's the third state? The third state of the particle, or the qubit, or the atom is called superposition. Superposition only exists if you don't measure it. Meaning, if you leave it alone without observation or calculation, it remains in a superposition state. Superposition means it's both one and zero at the same time. One and zero at the same time. Now, this is why I told you to throw away the physics laws you know. Because in our world, this doesn't make sense. Something being in two different states at once is impossible. For example, something cannot be hot and cold at the same time. That's impossible in our physics. But at the quantum level, in quantum mechanics, this is possible. Something can be hot and cold at the same time. It can be one and zero at the same time. Okay, if this is possible, and it is possible, we'll talk about it in a moment, then quantum computing becomes real. This is an example of a quantum computer. This part here is literally just the processor. All these wires and all this cooling are just to maintain the state of the atoms. Because heat, cold, and external physical factors affect the atom's state. All of this setup is required just to have a quantum computer. That's why quantum computers were never thought of as something for personal use. It's extremely difficult because you need all of this just to maintain the atom's state. Why maintain the atom's state? To keep its position, to preserve its measurement. If you can't, the error rate becomes very high. And if your computer has a high error rate, it's useless. For example, if you heat up a piece of metal, it becomes hot. But you don't know why it's hot at the atomic level. In quantum mechanics, heat and cold are literally defined by how excited the atoms are. If you put metal on fire, the atoms in the metal get excited, they move around a lot. And that motion itself gives you the sensation of heat. If the object is cold, its atoms are calm and stable. That's why when you touch the metal, it feels cold. So, for a quantum computer to work accurately, it must be cold, so that atoms are stable. That's why you see all this complicated cooling setup. But this is changing. Microsoft invented a processor called Majorana 1. Majorana is a quantum processor, and the particle or atom it uses is very stable. This particle is exotic, very strange, called fermions, fermion. These are extremely stable, stable enough to replace all of this setup. Basically, Microsoft has changed the world with this. There are two things that will change humanity in the future. Artificial intelligence, which we're already seeing, and it hasn't even reached its peak yet. Quantum computing, the next big leap. This is the first step. The future will be very exciting. The benefit of quantum computers isn't just that they're faster than today's processors. No, no. We're talking about things that seem like magic. For example, the processors we have now, 
If I wanted to break a bank's encryption, just one transaction, with today's processors, it would take millions of years. Millions of years to break just one encryption. A quantum computer can break that encryption in a second, or less than a second. Why? Because it has superposition, one and zero at the same time, which allows it to calculate in a way that classical processors can't. So if you have Bitcoin, after hearing this, you might start to worry. Blockchain encryption doesn't mean much against quantum computers. They could break it in seconds. So sell your Bitcoin. That's the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you understood it. The last thing I ever expected on my channel was to explain quantum mechanics. But here we are. See you in the next video. Goodbye.